Layoffs at Microsoft's gaming division, 1,900 employees at Activision Blizzard, and Xbox are losing their jobs. Sony is laying off 900 employees at its PlayStation division. The cuts include the closure of an entire studio. EA has announced plans to lay off 5% of its staff, continuing its initiative to never appear in positive news coverage. It certainly sounds like the gaming industry is in trouble. It's both the best year and the worst year for the games industry, right? So last year we saw, you know, a total of 10,500 announced layoffs in the industry. Uh, it's now the end of February. We're already up to 7,100 or something like that. But the global games market reached an estimated 217 billion in 2023, according to video game data firm Aldora. New high score! What does high score mean? New high score, is that bad? What does that mean? Did I break it? So what's with all the layoffs? I think that Sony probably assumed that the PlayStation 5 would trend the same way the PS2, 3, and 4 did, and it's not selling as many, you know, period. I mean, they're, they're uh, three full years into the cycle and they sold 54 million units. Um, they typically sell north of 20 million a year. Meanwhile, Microsoft's layoffs came following its huge acquisition of Activision Blizzard. And the FTC isn't too happy about it after it failed to block the deal. So there was certainly a lot of redundancy. You don't need two CFOs or as many HR people or as many legal people. The torrent of job cuts then seemed to point to a transition in the industry, not necessarily turmoil. Microsoft's $69 billion Activision Blizzard acquisition is an exclamation mark on a trend seen for years from console heavyweights. They've been gobbling up studios and publishers to strengthen their stable in competition to be a gamer's top hardware choice. Before its blockbuster Activision deal, Microsoft bought ZeniMax Media for $7.5 billion in 2020, adding the Doom, Fallout, and Elder Scroll series to its catalog. And back when these big deals were just a pipe dream in 2014, Microsoft still spent two and a half billion to buy the studio behind Minecraft. Sony's feeling the pressure to up the acquisition game. They dropped 3.7 billion on Destiny Maker Bungie in 2022, but most of their meals are smaller studios. Either you invest lots of money internally and develop it yourself, or you acquire and hope it works. Microsoft's recent acquisitions are an attempt to attract gamers to its subscription service Game Pass, which offers a plethora of first-party, AAA, and indie games that rotate in and out, like Netflix or Hulu for the gaming world. If you spend enough time in Game Pass, you never have to leave. If you spend enough time in Netflix, you never have to leave. Do you miss out on, you know, Oppenheimer? Yes, you do. But can you live without seeing Oppenheimer? Strong subscription offerings are crucial to the bottom line, considering making money off consoles is like trying to squeeze blood from a turnip. It's no secret that Sony and Microsoft are willing to sell their hardware at a loss in order to lock you into their ecosystem of accessories, subscription services, and software. So when somebody goes and they buy an Xbox at their local retailer, uh, we're subsidizing that purchase somewhere between $100 and $200 with the expectation that we will recoup that investment over time through accessory sales and storefront. They rely upon uh, you know, scale to bring down the cost of the components. So, you know, years ago, I mean, 2005, flash memory was super expensive and by 2013 it was cheap, but that's not happening anymore. We're not seeing component costs coming down as rapidly. Before every console was connected to the internet, the business model was simple. Develop a game in the most cost-effective way, sell as many copies as possible, and try to come up with another idea to do it all over again. We've sort of seen this inversion over the last five years where it used to be that the platform was the biggest thing. That's right. And the games would sort of tuck in within the platform. Today, big games like a Roblox or a Fortnite could actually be bigger than any one platform. Yeah, and uh, that really has changed the way that we think about things. Now, games as a service, known as live games, are king. These are games that have a continuing revenue model rather than just the initial purchase. This can be done in a lot of ways. For the there are monthly subscriptions for playtime, something you'll see in World of Warcraft. Then there are microtransactions, low-cost purchases that include cosmetic items or power-ups. While these appear in all kinds of games, they are most prevalent in mobile games. We did a whole piece on Kim Kardashian Hollywood that really breaks this down. 
Then there's the season pass. The guys who invented season pass were the epic guys with Fortnite. And, you know, it's brilliant. For a season pass, you might spend 10 bucks and get 20 bucks worth of stuff. But the boost only lasts for a short period of time. The real um, rationale for season pass is not to collect the 10 bucks for the pass. It's to keep the player engaged with daily tasks because the player who comes back every day to make sure he gets his money's worth and earns his little thing tends to stay an extra 10 or 20 or 30 minutes and more engagement just necessarily translates to higher in-app purchase. You know, the idea is to convert MAUs into DAUs and that conversion goes up with the season pass. Along with constant revenue streams, live games give developers the chance to keep building out the game as they go, instead of presenting a finished product up front without knowing what demand for it might be. At the same time, you know, you could also then uh, sort of shape the experience according to the like, likes of, a, of the audience, right? So it's much more of a back and forth rather than we develop this pristine experience right here in secret and then now we hope that it works. You know, some people like to watch movies in a theater, be entertained for two hours and go home and talk about the movie for a week. And others like to watch reality TV shows and watch you know, dating shows and guess who the bachelor's gonna pick. So those are completely different experiences. Live services is far more analogous to reality TV than it is to you know, a self-contained film. But let's talk about those self-contained films. Since the dawn of the modern video game industry, it's been console-exclusive video games driving sales to a specific platform. It's me, the Mario and the Luigi. They've built their fan base uh, very strongly around these exclusive. Like Sony and Microsoft have really put together a marketing plan for their devices that has a particular personality, and so people identify very closely with it. But in February, as rumors swirled that Xbox may be offering some of its exclusive wares to its competitors, the gaming media acted like it was the end of the brand as we know it. The gaming press plays to that stupid infantile approach uh, by saying, oh no, no, Microsoft, our understanding is gaming press is all console first party titles should be exclusive and you're violating our preconceived notion that you know that of how it should be all that drama culminated with a special edition of the xbox podcast featuring microsoft gaming ceo phil spencer so we made the decision that we're going to take four games to the other consoles um just four games not a change to our kind of fundamental exclusive strategy. Those games include Pirate Sim, Sea of Thieves, Grounded, Hi-Fi Rush, and Pentiment. A far cry from Halo and Gears of War leaving Xbox. So I actually think Microsoft's overarching goal is to sell Game Pass subscriptions, and their strategy is to hook the consumer. And I think that they're acknowledging right now that they don't have everybody. What makes Fortnite so successful, what makes Minecraft so successful is that they're available on any platform. And so increasingly we'll be moving in that direction. And then we become much more platform agnostic. Despite these notable changes to the gaming industry, don't expect the traditional console war to end in a peace treaty. People have been questioning the continuity, the, the extent of the console that it's going to be around, like you described for much longer, the death of the console is, sort of the new, you know, is, is not a new conversation. I mean, I just think sales get cut in half next cycle, not to zero, and then they get cut in half again the next cycle, and they get cut in half again the next cycle. It's a little bit the equivalent of having really, really expensive headphones or really, really, really high definition televisions in your eye. Like, there's always going to be an audience for that, and then there's everybody else. The reasons behind the job cuts vary. This year's gaming layoffs are on track to far outpace last year's. But it doesn't appear to be the canary in the coal mine for an industry that has seen substantial growth in recent years. I would expect all of these companies in 18 months to be rehiring a lot of the people that just laid off.